COVID-19, and we all remember the loved ones we lost. The bill will still undergo scrutiny in the Parliament's Health Committee. Over 15 million people died. During the pandemic, according to the estimates from the World Health Organization, The pandemic caught us by surprise, overwhelming our health systems in both developed and developing countries alike. Medical workers on the front line fought on to the very end. Sometimes, it was so hard to bear. Watching people die as they gasped for breath. This was a state of emergency. What could save the world was a vaccine. For years, that's the fastest a vaccine has ever been developed, but most take about five to ten years. Every second spent was a breath taken. Time was not on our side. Dozens of research teams around the world, largely from the global north, rushed to the labs to develop a vaccine for SARS-CoV-2, the virus that causes COVID-19, using a mix of established techniques and technologies. Funding for a vaccine has never been greater, with billions of dollars invested in making a product that could help control the pandemic. The US, China, and Europe invested the most as different pharmaceutical companies started the race for a vaccine. Moderna and Pfizer had established themselves as the leaders in the race of vaccine development by developing a COVID-19 vaccine. Both companies published their initial clinical data between July and August. By 31st December 2020, Pfizer developed a COVID vaccine with an efficacy of about 95%. AstraZeneca followed later in February Johnson & Johnson in March, Moderna in April, and many others as the months unfolded. With a vaccine in hand, vaccine nationalism was evident. Many high-income countries directly negotiated large advanced orders for the vaccines, leaving resource-limited countries scrambling for access. AstraZeneca said it had reached an agreement with several governments, including the UK and the US, to produce at least two billion doses of vaccines. At the time, Africa remained desperate for vaccines. Despite the existence of international structures like the COVID-19 vaccine Global Access COVAX, Africa was left in the cold, unable to procure enough vaccines for its people. COVAX strategized its approach by promoting fundraising coordinating vaccine donations from countries with surplus doses and facilitating the expansion of the manufacturing capacity. After waiting for months, donations started trickling in from COVAX facilities and other countries from the global north and China. This was a big lesson for African leaders. In April 2021, African Union Commission and the African Center for Disease Control held a summit calling for a framework of action that will enable Africa to manufacture 60% of its own vaccines by 2040. In 2022, the Partnerships for African Vaccine Manufacturing, PAVAM, 
presented a framework that forms the blueprint of how the continent is going to achieve this goal by being self-reliant and meeting her vaccination needs. I'm investigative journalist Solomon Serwanja. I speak with African leaders, scientists, researchers, investors, and representatives from civil society to seek answers to what it will really take for Africa to manufacture 60% of its vaccines locally by 2040. It is 5th March 2023. African leaders, scientists, researchers, civil society, investors, and partners gather in Rwanda's capital Kigali for the Africa Health Agenda International Conference 2023. Top on agenda is a candid discussion on how the COVID-19 tested the resilience of our health systems and the lessons that we learned. We are not investing adequately in the health workforce. We are not investing adequately in pandemic preparedness and response machinery. Neither are we investing adequately in the health system itself. We are living through the consequences of a failure to adequately invest and prioritize public health needs in Africa. And this is the very impetus of Africa CDC's call for a new public health order, guided by the principles of local ownership, of local leadership, of equity, of innovation, and self-reliance. There is a lot of optimism in the room, premising on our experience, especially on how the Global North handled this emergency. Where these investments were made, there was infrastructure, there was capacity, there was capability already in place that they could leverage to then accelerate uh, activities. And this is the issue when it comes to Africa. We need to gear ourselves up. We have started now uh, largely because of the trigger of COVID uh, to do so. That needs to gain momentum uh, by an order of magnitude or, or, or two into the future. But I am uh, uh, encouraged and optimistic that if we build on this uh, surge that we've had in terms of interest um, around vaccine development and manufacture on the continent, then we can achieve something. But it will take more than just hope, according to Patrick Tipol, the executive director of the African Vaccine Manufacturing Initiative. Patrick, who also doubles as the Chief Science and Innovations Officer at BioVac, a South African farm that produces vaccines, tells me that vaccine manufacturing takes huge investment and therefore there are some guarantees that have to be made before anyone sinks a dollar into this venture, especially the market. 60% of the Gavi volumes come into Africa, so it's not trivial at all. So Gavi is a big uh, market shape, uh, uh, market shaping player uh, in Africa. And again, uh, uh, very encouragingly, Gavi is re-looking at its model to see how uh, that can incentivize investments in, uh, in, in vaccine production. But governments also have a role to play. The self-procuring countries need to put their money where their mouths are and come up with a plan that says we will buy from local African producers as and when their products become available and meet the uh, requisite quality requirements. We guarantee purchase from them. But the guarantee of the market would require commitment from African states and their partners. For anyone to invest in vaccine manufacturing, numbers count. Vaccine production relies on economies of scale to be cost effective. And the reason for that is that uh, between 70% and 80% of the vaccine production costs are fixed costs. So the variable costs are only 20%, which means that as you increase volume, your costs don't increase proportionately. So when you, when you build up to scale, the cost of goods go down. And that means that you can then begin to compete in the open market on a more competitive basis. So during that window period of 10 or years plus, African vaccine manufacturers require the support in terms of uh, a premium that 
governments and other procuring agencies are prepared to pay in order to build this capacity so that in the event of a pandemic, whenever it comes, we will have the capacity prepared and ready on the continent. In some countries where economies of scale have been guaranteed, investments have already been made in research and development and setting up infrastructure for mass production. For example, Biovac in South Africa, Atlantic Life Science in Ghana, to mention but a few. Just to have a glimpse of what this means, I visited Sipla Quality Chemicals, a pharmaceutical manufacturing company located in Uganda's capital, Kampala. It is the largest pharmaceutical manufacturing plant in sub-Saharan Africa, certified by WHO to manufacture medicines for treating HIV AIDS and malaria. Ajay Kumapal is the CEO of the pharmaceutical giant. The company produces and supplies 16 million doses of both antiretroviral drugs and anti-malarials combined to over 18 countries across Africa. Demand justifies what you can invest and how you're going to make sure there is a return on that investment. So a starting point for Africa is demand. There is progress with AFCFTA that we can move goods from one place to other place without any barriers. And there is a huge amount of change we have seen. But to reach that point, Africa has to start look itself as one market with no barrier among each other. Because if we look into smaller countries and some with population of 10 million people, some with population of 40 million people, some with population of 150 million people, and somebody wants to invest in a country with 10 million population, the market is too small to justify that investment. Ajay, however, emphasizes partnerships and specialization if Africa is to achieve its goal of producing both vaccines and pharmaceuticals to treat its population. We can decide that one country takes a lead in research and development and one takes a lead in manufacturing. The easiest way to, to expand to is, is to add on to what you're already doing. So most easier companies to grow is those who are already established and they expand because they already have know-how, they already have support, they already have an understanding. For them, it's always easier to build more capacity. Second one is to, to partner with someone and, and that partnership can be in various spaces with respect to what leg of pharmaceutical value chain you start. Do you start with packaging or you start with manufacturing or you do the core API production? Third could be for small innovations, specifically for innovative therapies, right? New, like, like in today's world, beyond mRNA, now DNA. Now those are smaller investment like innovators and then you invest them as seed investment or startups then you outgrow them as they started to operate on a model which is successful which could be defined by demand. Speaking of research and development, one of the core programs of PAVAM is putting in place vaccine research and development centers and coordinating platforms. It all starts here. It is where the brain work begins developing the vaccine. It takes scientists, sophisticated equipment, and heavy investment to get through the process of producing a vaccine. One such place is the Uganda Virus Research Institute, a center of excellence in research on viruses in East and Central Africa. Equipped with the state-of-the-art technology and machinery, as well as human resources, the center has been studying different viruses including HIV, Marburg, Ebola, and the latest COVID-19. Professor Pontiano Kalevo heads the institute. For vaccine uh, development, many people look at the end product of a vaccine, but there are so many things that are involved. For instance, we've been working at, uh, if you want to have a vaccine, what immune response do you want to induce? Yeah? There are people here who have been studying for a long time to understand an immune response a vaccine should induce for HIV. Yeah? So they study the immune responses, that this is what is needed. That contributes to vaccine development. There are people who are looking at the viruses. What viruses do we have and which composition to put into a vaccine? That's very important. Yeah? The people who are doing uh, clinical trials, that's important. Uh, we have been looking at uh, transmitted viruses to understand how they look, 
so that we can design an HIV vaccine. We don't, we have not developed an HIV vaccine, but we have been contributing. But more recently, uh, we have been, uh, even before COVID, I, I can tell you uh, before COVID, uh, we had one of our students, we collaborated with Imperial College to start a, a vaccine uh, manufacture facility yeah, uh, for messenger RNA, interestingly, even before COVID. And we sent our student to London to design a vaccine for Rift Valley fever. He designed it, it went into mice, it was nice. Now he has reproduced it here. Yeah. And that, as he was doing this, that's when COVID came. So we started thinking about this even before COVID. So we have really uh, uh, students and scientists who are working on RNA vaccines here. Though the process has been slow, the center is going into clinical trials for COVID-19 vaccine. Uh, currently, we're working on COVID vaccines, yeah? from the bench, from the lab. We have reached at a level where we want to test these vaccines in mice. That's easy, easier. But to go into humans, you need good manufacturing practice. We don't have the facility. We have started talking to contract this out to others. And that is possible. You don't need to do the whole chain. You can design and have your IP patent issues. You design the vaccine. Then you contract another company to do the GMP because you have not reached, you don't have any facility that can do GMP. That is possible. You retain your scientific discovery and IP issues, but others can do the final bits. He, however, opines that Africa's focus on research and development has been rather blurry with limited funding affecting their ability to do advanced vaccine research. But this Less, there is not a lot of investment in research, as you know. We have not reached all the goals uh, that African governments promised many years back to invest in uh, research and development. That's a, a big problem. Uh, but also in uh, manufacture, uh, if you leave research and development uh, alone, uh, but also to develop the capacity to have facilities that are going to make vaccines and the diagnostics and the drugs at the international standards, we are very, very much behind. But we have been talking about this over a period of time. For many of you, you are hearing this because of COVID. I've been in many African uh, meetings for years during the time of HIV AIDS. We're talking about all this. How do we invest in research and development for vaccines? It's a little bit complicated. Professor Kalevu is now mooting for the idea of African unity to collectively work together to develop and support different research and development centers of excellence. But as the interest for African states to invest in scientific research and development grows, Professor Kalevo is advocating for technology transfer. Uh, as you know, in Africa, we have a few countries that have plants, manufacturing uh, plants, about six of them. The low-hanging fruit is to really make negotiations with the vaccine developers uh, to transfer so that they can do fill and finish. Some of these uh, uh, countries are doing that yeah, so that we can, Africa, right? South Africa, yeah. Senegal, uh, Egypt. Egypt, Morocco and all that, uh, uh, so that we can, yeah, even without doing our own R&D, but use, negotiate intellectual property and markets and do that. A classic example of where technology transfer has worked very well is in South Africa, where BioVac formed a partnership with Sinovac and Pfizer. Uh, in summary, government went to these companies and said, we have a local vaccine manufacturer called BioVac. If you've won the tender for product one, if you agree to uh, transfer part of your technology to BioVac for localizing certain aspects of the vaccine manufacturing value chain, we would extend that tender by, by three years to a total of five years. So for five years, you would have unchallenged access to the South African market and supply to the Department of Health for your product. In the case of Sanofi, it was the Hexaxim. And it was attractive enough for Sanofi to consider that as a deal, formed a transaction with BioVac, and the rest is history in that that technology transfer has led to BioVac having a uh, vial uh, filling and finishing capability that has been built up over a period of time. But even with this, 
Neha Agawal, the Global Diagnostics Programs Director at PATH, says that Africa needs to look beyond just technology transfer in vaccine manufacturing. You know, I think tech technology transfer is something, uh, it's easy on paper and very hard to do in reality. Um, and so I think you need experts who've been there, who have done that, that have been integral to the actual innovation process. And I think that there are a lot of partners who are interested and really willing to support technology transfer. So I think we need to tap into that a bit more. When we think about things like, what are the various reagents and raw materials that we need to make a vaccine? Um, a lot of those are hosted at uh, places like NIBSC, the National Institute for Biologics and Standards, which is out of the UK. That's actually a government entity that runs that. And then there's other um, companies like the big pharmaceutical companies that do a lot of their antibody manufacturing themselves. They have very little incentive to make those reagents available to smaller scale manufacturers based in LMICs or even based in the global north. Nea also argues that sustainable vaccine manufacturing will require financial independence from the global north, or better still, partnerships. We need to localize the funding ecosystem, because if it's still global north partners funding the localization, what if funding dries up? What if there's another pandemic and all of a sudden research dollars go back to Global North priorities. So the more we can take steps to localize the entire ecosystem, then only will we really have sustainability. The issue of financing has been central to the discussion of Africa's dream of self-reliance on its pharmaceuticals and vaccines. Back at the Africa Health Agenda Conference, Dr. Magda Robalo poured her heart out to challenge African leaders and the private sector to take keen interest in funding the entire vaccine manufacturing value chain. We need to look into our own internal resources and then look for external partnerships to complement our efforts, but it cannot be. Uh, it's a matter of sovereignty. You cannot have an ambitious goal of producing 60% of the vaccines your people need by 2040 and then sit and wait for foreigners to bring the money for you to do it. Another key issue that has been raised by health experts is the establishment of quality management systems to ensure that all vaccines produced in Africa are at global standards. In fact, one of the programs of PAVAM is strengthening national regulatory agencies and regional centers of regulatory excellence. Dr. Margaret Sigonda is one of the people championing this cause. She is the head of health programs at the African Union Development Agency, NEPAD, and currently leading the regulatory work stream of the PAVAM framework. With regulation, you can be assured that the patients will have access to safe, efficacious, and good quality medical products. Without it, the market will be flooded by substandard and falsified medical products, and that's a risk to public health. So you want to make sure that you have very robust systems to um, ensure that the risk posed by medicines is actually um, averted. And the, another good news is that on the continent, we already have five national regulatory agencies that have attained the WHO maturity level three, which is really um, a criteria that you, is used to measure the robustness of, and the trustedness of your regulatory system in a country. So that is good news for Africa because even for AMA, to have a strong AMA, you require strong national regulatory agencies. And so we think that with the five national regulatory agencies that have attained that such a maturity status, then they can become like uh, anchors and mentors to other regulatory agencies that are aspiring to also mature and eventually we can have a, a really robust regulatory ecosystem on the continent once AMA is fully operational. Dr. Sigonda is quite optimistic about the progress so far made on the regulatory framework and support to national and regional bodies. And to date, as I'm speaking now, we already have some continental guidelines developed already to guide the member states in undertaking these activities. 
We've also um, been able to create what we call um, continental framework for vaccines, lot testing and lot release. And essentially, this framework for vaccines, uh, testing and lot release is aiming at assisting especially vaccine producing countries that do not have laboratory capacity to be able to benefit from those that have capacity. Currently, on the continent, we have South Africa that has capacity to do vaccines test, testing in lot of release, and Egypt. These are the two countries. Others are still trying to build their capacity. Their efforts to operationalize the African Medicines Agency, which will be the continental regulatory body to oversee vaccine manufacturing on the continent. African Medicines Agency is a very critical piece when it comes to um, strengthening the regulatory ecosystem on the continent. And uh, I think the, it should also be known that the African Medicines Agency is an offshoot of the African Medicines Regulatory Harmonization Initiative. Because AMA is a treaty-based organization and it requires countries to ratify before they become members of the state parties of AMA. And so currently we only have 24 countries that have rat ratified and deposited the instrument of ratification with the African Union Commission. So it may take time to get all the countries on board, but the good thing is that since we already have an existing initiative, the African Medicine Regulatory Harmonization Initiative, which is catering for all the 55 member states, so it makes it easier to make sure that all the countries are supported and all countries are part and parcel of operationalization of the African Medicines Agency. But as we wait for all countries to deposit their instruments of power to the African Medicines Agency, their efforts to approve some vaccines that have been developed recently. We are working on a program which is uh, focusing on, uh, on uh, vaccines development for Lassa fever in West Africa. Lassa fever is a disease that is affecting mostly the West Africa region. And we've reached a point where we have dedicated, you know, a program to do epidemiological studies, but also R&D for vaccines for Lassa fever. And we are also capacitating the regulators and the ethics committee to be able to give the necessary approval so that the, such vaccines can be availed, can be accessible by the population in the Western African region. We are also looking into, for instance, Rift, Rift Valley fever that is affecting mostly Sub-Saharan Africa. We are looking into how best can we use these structures that we have, the regional structures, the national regulatory agents, the ethics committee, to provide oversight on and, and making sure that we have such vaccines available to the people on the continent for diseases that affect us most. At the tail end of the vaccine manufacturing value chain is the demand for the vaccines. It is one thing making the vaccines, it is another thing for the public to accept the vaccines. There is growing vaccine hesitancy among the population, which in itself is a challenge. Dr. Moses Molumba is the executive director of Afya Nahaki, a civil society organization whose focus is on promoting health and justice through the Afrocentric ideology. He argues that it is important to involve communities at the grassroots level in the vaccine manufacturing conversation. The missing point in the entire conversations on vaccine and regional manufacturing is that we have kept it very high level, we've kept it at a policy level, and we are forgetting that the end is at the end user who is going to be benefiting. So we are not engaging them enough. People in the communities don't relate with the science that we are discussing. People at the country level are also not relating enough with the conversations at the African Union. And this is not surprising because we have seen that even at the sub-regional level, like at the East African community, at the SADC level, we are never capable of translating the conversations of sub-regional level to the national level. Now, if we can't translate that to the national level, a huge opportunity is missed. And it becomes very difficult for people at the, at the country level and within communities to pick up these global regional important conversations. He argues that communities are also central to holding governments accountable to their commitments if well mobilized by civil society. 
this starts with community mobilization. Once the community knows what their governments have committed through civil society organizations, through the patient groups, it is going to be very easy. We've seen that things like maternal mortality, have, communities have been able to hold governments accountable. We've seen that people have been able to hold parliamentary conversations and they have rejected budgets which parliaments are passing without increasing them. And in some sectors we've seen improvement. So this is very, very important. Community mobilization and accountability mechanisms as part of the governance for these vaccines that we are talking about is going to be very central and critical. Accountability, according to Dr. Mulumba, is advocating for legal and policy frameworks to support vaccine manufacturing and trade within Africa. When I see positive narratives around the fact that it's possible to have 60% by 2040 vaccine manufactured on the continent, I think that is very promising. But we need to follow it up with political support, political will. We need to follow it up with coordination, proper partnerships that we need to be seeing. But we also need to be foresighted because we don't only need vaccines. There is a whole infrastructure that is required. How do you deliver the vaccines? How do you ensure that all these other commodities that accompany the vaccines are actually followed? And it's very important. So it's important that the ambition is there, but this ambition needs to be followed with policies and implementation of those policies. Legal and policy frameworks will, however, not be the magic bullet. Professor Oyewale Tomori, a virologist from Nigeria, has been advocating for African unity as a means of achieving vaccine independence. We need to look at diseases as another disease, as another, as another colonial enemy, you know, as another enemy which must combine together. As we overcame the colonial people, so also we'll be able to overcome uh, diseases by uniting together, bringing in all the resources we have. It's not every country in Africa that has every talent, but if we bring, pull all our resources together, we can overcome and stop being a beggar to the world. Unity, according to Professor Tomori, will also require pulling financial resources together to support vaccine manufacturing. If all Africa decide we're going to buy a vaccine from Senegal, Senegal will be sustainable. But if we, we now say, oh no, we're waiting for bilateral assistance, we're waiting for donation, instead of putting our money into it, of course the man who gives you the donation is not going to let you buy from Senegal. He's going to let you buy from his own country. That's where the problem is. That division, not coming together, that's why it makes vaccine production in Africa unsustainable. But all we require, as I said, we cannot produce all the vaccine we need. But four, five, six of them have countries that have the capacity, let them produce the vaccine. And then every one of us in Africa will buy from that person. We will start it. And then they can even move on to other things in the future. But so long as we are still have that mentality that, oh, donation has to come or something, we will never get to that level. Africa's vaccine manufacturing agenda must be fronted with political will to provide great leadership and direction. Professor Tomori is now challenging leaders to raise to the occasion. Long-term investment is what not Europe, what it is today. I only say short-term thing sometimes, we, we have what you call political will. But political will is mere talk. It, it, is, it has to be backed up by commitment, and that's the fund. Is it that we don't have the fund? I don't think so. I think it's because we're misusing the funds we have, and that's why we're where we are today. How many uh, resolutions have we signed in Africa? They, they are more than the disease that we, we, we feel, but what did we do with the resolution? He fears that the worst could come in case we do not move fast. No matter what happens, when the epidemic goes, it, the, 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 that's the end of the uh, epidemic, Africa forgets what is happening until the next one comes. The lessons we learned from the past one, we forget easily. And we start running helter skelter when the next one comes. And I think that attitude has to change. Nevertheless, he remains hopeful about the future. I have hope. I will not be talking to you now if I didn't have hope. I'm 70 something years old and I've been struggling for this for the last 50 years. If I'm still talking, it's because I have hope. And the hope is not, may not be me, maybe me at the background to talk to you, but for you young people to take up Africa in your own hand and say, if you not be like what was happening to my grandfather. Africa's dream of manufacturing 60% of its vaccine needs by 2040 is quite ambitious, but all of us have hope that if we start today by being deliberate about implementing the blueprint in the PAVAM commitment, hold ourselves accountable to the target set, we shall indeed get there. For now though, 
I remain hopeful that one day we shall stop begging and start giving. Solomon Serwanja, AIJ unveils. Thank you.